Most of it came from generating jobs. During the pandemic, that job generation engine slowed down and reversed. And in fact, poverty alleviation reversed in many parts of the world. ASEAN is an exception which has come out of it well. But many parts of the world are seeing an increase in poverty, not a reduction. So the, the reality is that we have to go past poverty and we have to incorporate climate and pandemics and fragility and food insecurity into our lives. And so the, the mission, the vision of the bank will be to create a world free of poverty, but on a livable planet. And by livable planet, we include all these other dimensions. So we can expand the aperture of which the way the bank looks at a problem and go from only poverty to all of these and expand our appetite and our view and our knowledge and our capacity to deal with these. That's kind of the first big uh, piece. It is to me a big piece because getting it right enables the bank's outstanding employees to focus on a much bigger picture. The second piece is how we work. And I think there, there are multiple parts, but the first part is to measure output, not input. And what do I mean by that? I think saying how many projects we finance or how many dollars we put in is interesting and important, but what is even more important is how many girls went to school because of the centers we built, or how many people got a better job which pays better because they were lucky enough to go to a skilling center that the bank had worked on with the local government, or how many greenhouse gas emissions we managed to avoid and then convert through a carbon market into the transfer of resources for that community as well as the government to benefit from, and so on. The output, not the input. Measuring that is very important. The second part that's very important is going to be how we work in partnership with others. My opinion and the opinion of many of us is that there is not enough money in the world of multilateral banks, of governments, or of philanthropy to solve the kind of issues we are discussing. If you believe in the estimates that people say that you need a trillion dollars a year to be invested just in renewable energy, just in renewable energy, to turn the tide over the next coming decades, a trillion dollars a year does not exist on our balance sheets or in philanthropy or in government. So we have to get the private sector in as well. We need all shoulders at the wheel. So to give you an example, a few days ago, we announced a partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank that we would work on three issues together in Latin America. The Amazon and all aspects of the Amazon. Reforestation, but importantly, looking after the communities in the Amazon. Second dealing with the challenges of climate adaptation in the Caribbean, which is severely stressed by what is going on, and third, digitization and its benefits for governance and education in Latin America. Now, if Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank get together, that's two shoulders at the wheel. And like that, we need to work with the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, as well as, most importantly, with the private sector as well, to bring this money in. So there's a series of things we're trying to do in our approach to partnership, which we hope will bend the curve over the coming years. And then I'd say the, the, the last and not the least of this has to do with capital and the adequacy of capital. The G20 laid out a common framework which we are working on to help look at the capital adequacy systems in the bank, whether it's equity loan ratios or it's the kind of things we can do with hybrid capital and portfolio guarantees and the funding of concessional capital for countries to be able to put to resource on the right problems. All those are part of what we are doing. We're going to look to our donor nations and philanthropies to now put their shoulder to the wheel to help us build up this capital buffer. But then once this is done, and we can say we are a better bank than we used to be, a good bank but an even better bank, at that time will be the time to discuss what should be our common appetite for a bigger bank in the future. And I think that's the staging of where we are with the evolution process. When you come to Marrakesh, which I know you will, hopefully you will see more of this being discussed with the governors there in October. Thank you very much, Sajai. Now let me turn to, to you, Klaus. You mentioned about this industrial 4.0. If I may raise my concern, my biggest concern is not about industrial 4.0, but about governance 4.0. Yeah, because I can imagine that the product cycle is getting shorter and shorter and will be very difficult for the policymakers or the regulators to come up with the regulation which is 
maybe your your regulation will be obsolete in the next six months. Under this kind of situation, what we probably need is an agile bureaucracy. But agile bureaucracy is an oxymoron. So how, in, in, in your view, how do you see sort of like, you know, the role of the governance here, especially for many ASEAN countries? Is there anything that they can particularly do related to address this issue? If we look at uh, public-private cooperation, I think we have to find very flexible ways to coordinate the efforts. I mean, governments still provide direction, but business provides the innovative power. And I would argue that long term, with all the importance of capital, we move from the era of capitalism to the era of talentism, which means that the key competitive factor will become innovation and not any more low cost or the availability of uh, capital. Of course, they are necessary, but the decisive factor will be uh, the innovative capacity and power of a country. And here, of course, ASEAN has a great um, privilege. It has a useful entrepreneurial young uh, it has a young generation, and I have met here so many uh, young entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm very impressed. But I would add one other thing. I think we knew, move not only from uh, capitalism to talentism in some way, but even more important, we move from, stakeholder, from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. And I'm very proud to see how the business community has embraced this concept, which is now very much um, under, uh, contested in certain other parts of the world. Business is not only here to, to create prosperity. I think business has also a social role, which means to serve society and to take care of the environment. So we have to build this notion of stakeholder capitalism in, into all of our activities as business leaders. And let me make a, a uh, last comment here. Um, the future, and I repeat what has been said several times, will be decided by the flexibility and adaptability of economies. And here, the more diverse an economy is organized, the less it is, um, the more it is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, suitable to sustain shocks. Thank you very much, Pa Klaus. Now let me turn to you, uh, Pa Watanabe. As the Indo-Pacific is projected to be the largest global growth contributor for the next 30 years, how can ASEAN sustain this upward trajectory and increase its economic significance? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me highlight uh, two obvious uh, challenges ahead. Uh, digital transformation and sustainability. On digital, uh, uh, the launching of uh, ASEAN initiative of uh, digital economy framework agreement uh, uh, is very timely to set the uh, uh, regional framework on uh, governance of digital technologies, cyber security, and uh, people's citizen relationship with uh, emerging technologies. This is very timely and appropriate initiative. On sustainability, uh, this region is continued to grow. It's quite different from other regions. So we need to uh, sustain growth while uh, addressing uh, uh, affordable energy transition towards uh, net zero. That's a huge challenge. And the uh, area uh, is here to uh, design a, a practical and affordable pathway to, uh, to achieving the net zero uh, by facilitating realistic energy transitions and uh, innovative uh, energy finance. 
And so my last point uh, would be uh, for ASEAN to uh, sustain growth trajectory in the long term, the ultimate test is to uh, achieve uh, peace and stability in ASEAN and in the wider region of the Indo-Pacific. And ASEAN's experience of community building and uh, as an anchor of the regional cooperation has brought us together like we do today uh, is a global asset. So if uh, 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 ASEAN's basic principle of uh, mutual trust and mutual growth and mutual respect can be a key principle for, for cooperation in wider region of Indo-Pacific. That's a sort of a cornerstone for ASEAN and for this region to continue to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I think, the, unfortunately, the time is up, and we only have 45 minutes. I'm sure there are so many questions that I would like to, to pose to all these great panelists, but the time is up. I don't want to summarize our discussion, but let me highlight some of the couple important points. I think we are living in a very uncertain world now, but as we heard from the distinguished panelists, uh, we see that um, there is some optimism that ASEAN can continue to become the uh, bright spot of the global economy. Yeah, provided that, that we continue to maintain the so-called the good eco economic 101, maintaining the governance, and also adapting for the new technology and also improve the institution. With that note, then let me invite to all of you to give the big round of applause to our great panelists. And thank you very much. Thank you very much to our dearest moderator, Bapak Hatib Basri, the former Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia, for wonderfully moderating this illuminating session with our wonderful speakers. We'd like to thank our speakers for extending your great knowledge and expertise with all of us. And distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, on to our next session. Please allow me to invite to the stage Mr. Arshad Rashid, the Chair of ASEAN Business Advisory Council, to deliver a briefing on ABAX pro uh, programs and their linkages to AIPF and the Indo-Pacific. Let us give Mr. Arshad Rashid the biggest round of applause. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. I have only a short time for this briefing session in which I will share my thought based on my ASEAN point of views. ASEAN businesses are observing the dynamics and developments of the Indo-Pacific, where ASEAN is the center of this area. I have traveled to many dialogue partners countries, and they are very much interested in engaging more constructively. There are some thoughts I believe are crucial to align in different sectors in between ASEAN and Indo-Pacific. First, we have massive potentials towards enhancing our digital economy and facilitating cross-border data flow. The Indo-Pacific is the world's fastest growing region for internet adoptions and digital connectivity between people and businesses. Our region has been ambitious in our goals for economic, 
co-creations. Encouraging our private sectors to take on a bigger role in the development of our telecommunications infrastructure, maximizing our digital opportunities. Just yesterday, we, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, or ASEAN BAC, just launched the ASEAN QR code to build the business ecosystem in supporting the cross-border digital payment. We wish to expand this to more Indo-Pacific countries. Second, we have a growing young and educated population that will try, that will enter the workforce with more advanced digital skills. Partnered with the initiative taken by Indo-Pacific members to facilitate knowledge and technology exchanges to drive our future generations holds the necessary skill set and the resources to drive our industry to a new level. Because of our progress, we are well the way towards the more advanced world. The cooperation focusing on human talents is crucial, and the, enhance, the enhancement of social cultural development that put people-oriented solution must be the key. Third, the Indo-Pacific, and especially with ASEAN members, hold some of the world's greatest potentials for renewable clean energy and high-quality carbon credits. Our region is especially susceptible to climate change.